Hi everyone, this is Jeanette Chaliga with the Niagara County Genealogical Society. We we're supposed to be giving a program for beginners on vital records, but due to the coronavirus, we had to postpone our upcoming programs for the time being, so I thought I would record a shortened version of this program for everyone at home. So when we talk about birth, marriage, and death records, there are many different types of documents that, we, that might list those events. Today I'm just going to focus on civil records and not church records, as we have an upcoming program on church records. On Wednesday, June 24, 2020, um, at 7 p.m. at our location at uh, 215 Niagara Street in Lockport, Ward Bray is going to be teaching us about exploring church records as a part of your genealogical discovery. And as you can see in his description, it says this presentation gives a great deal of detail material to the attendee and prepares one to delve deep into the use of church records during your genealogical discovery. It addresses common myths, explains what one can hope to discover, gives recommendations for overcoming challenges and perceived barriers, and provides a specific search, search strategy. This class is structured more as a primer than a presentation and contains many direct and specific internet links which the attendee will be able to employ on their own. The attendee will return time and again to their digital copy of the material in order to use the provided links and advice. So we look forward to that in June. So as you probably know, vital records are not managed by the federal government. The state governments handle it. So therefore, each state has their own set of rules as far as accessibility and the time frame as to when they started requiring municipalities to record vital events. I also think it's important to take a moment to think about the history of our country. Pictured here are when the states became states, and as we first settled on the east coast of our country and then started to travel westward, the earlier states may have vital records prior to the western states. As our society is in New York State, I will use New York State as, as an example of when vital records began to get kept began to be kept. Where I go to learn about things like this is the Family Search Wiki. They have a whole wiki page on New York State Vital Records. This page includes an overview explaining record keeping back to the colony of New York in the 1600s. The state tried to enforce vital records to be kept by civil authorities back in 1847, but the law failed and was suspended in 1850 as the municipalities weren't complying. Some towns and cities began to keep records on their own without being mandated by the state. In 1880, New York State established a vital records division and passed a law that, once again, required the villages, towns, and city clerks to record births, marriages, and deaths. They were to keep a copy for themselves and send the original to the State Board of Health. Compliance was slow, and it took over 30 years to fully meet the standards. Certain areas such as Albany, Buffalo, Yonkers, New York City, and Brooklyn were exempt as they were already keeping vital records, and this remained the case until 1914 when the state required all copies of vital records to be recorded with them, except for New York City. New York City has their own vital records division. So even though the start date was supposed to be in 1880, due to lack of compliance, some believe that the actual start date for all events being recorded wasn't until about 1914. Another great resource where you can learn about New York State Vital Records is the New York um, Genealogical and Biographical Society's um, research, um, History Research Guide and Gazetteer. It's a two-volume set. Volume 1, Chapter 2 is titled Vital Records and includes a history of vital records in New York State, how to ex access them, and including when and where they are held, and a lot more. It's priced for $90, but if you are a New York GMB member, you get $25 off, so that would be $65. A few months ago this past fall, I gave a presentation focusing on death records. Um, that presentation goes more into detail about the history of New York State death records and gives many examples of other places to find dates of death for your ancestors. And so you can watch it on our YouTube channel after you're watching this one if you'd like. You can find us on YouTube for Niagara County Genealogical Society. 
All right, so let's start looking at vital records. We'll start with some birth records. And when you're looking at vital records, I like to stop, start at the top and, you know, just see the title. In this case, it's the New York State Department of Health Division of Vital Statistics, the city of Buffalo. This is for my grandmother, and from this record, now I know she was born in the city of Buffalo. It lists her name, the date she was born in 1929, the name of her parents, including the mother's maiden name, and then the date it was filed. Here's another example from the city of Buffalo, but this is from 1908. On the right hand side, you kind of have to turn your head sideways, um, is the top of the record. It has the name of the child and below her, the address of 841 Smith. It also says she was born on October 12th of 1908. Now if we look at it, you know, going from the top to the bottom, if we write our head again, um, this is a great example of just because it was a vital record doesn't mean that it's error free. Um, in this case, that is not how she spelled her middle name of Genevieve. Um, and as we saw on the right hand side, it had her address as 841 Smith. But if we start at the top and work down, it has her name, Margaret Genevieve Hetzel. She was female, white, date of birth, October 12th, 1908. Um, place of birth 842 Smith Street and that is the correct address 842. Her na um, father's name was John Hetzel. He resided at 842 Smith Street. He was born in Elma, New York. He was 41 years old. His occupation was a mill hand. The mother's name was Barbara Hetzel. Her name before marriage was Barbara Goldwitzer. Interesting that they don't say maiden name because if she was married more than once but um, her mother's residence is 842 Smith Street. The mother's birthplace was Buffalo, New York. Her age was eight, um, 42, and that she was a mother of eight children, six of which were living. And then the, the date that this was filed on was October 19th. Here's the other oopsie with this. She was born on October 11th, according to all the other records I have, not the 12th. So there was the address was wrong, the spelling of the middle name was wrong, and the date of birth is in question. Um, but it's, you know, it is a primary source. It does, you know, say that this was her date of birth, but I just wanted to say that this, you know, documents can be error prone. Here's another example of a birth record. Birth record. This is from the town of Randolph, and you can see it's a portion of a page in a book. In the upper right hand, where it says registered number 18, and then if we look down towards the bottom, where it's kind of cut off, you'll see the next one is registered number, well, it was 29, but they corrected it to 19. So you can tell that this was a copy of um, multiple birth records on these pages within this book. What's interesting to compare this one to the other two that we've seen, if you look at question number six underneath um, where it says Ivo McGinnity Johnson, question number six, it asks, is the child legitimate? And in this case, he was. So you really have to kind of read every single little detail to pull out information um, to help fill in those blanks in your family tree. This one is a transcript of a birth certificate that I received from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I contacted them requesting a copy of the original for genealogical purposes. And I got this email back. Um, it was from the PA State Archives and they were explaining that Pennsylvania has a 105 year privacy law on its birth certificates. So because this person was born in 1915 and even though I have his death certificate, they still cannot release me his birth certificate for 105 years. So as the email says, I could check back on January 2nd of 2021 and for $5 that they will send me a copy of the original birth certificate. Another type of birth certificate you might come across is a delayed registration of birth. My great grandmother was born in 1897 and her birth wasn't recorded at the time, even though it should have been. <laughs> Later in life, she applied for a delayed birth certificate in 1959. I'm not sure why she did it. Maybe it was requir required for her to get a passport or something, but it's a really an interesting document to look at as she had to prove her birth and um, the witnesses you know, helping in the documents supporting 
her date of birth to create this document. And I have a handful of these that I've come across in my genealogy research, and I wonder if you guys do too. They're, they're a lot of fun to look at. So that's our birth certificates. Now let's take a look at some marriage records. Here's an example of a marriage record. Um, and again, you can tell that this was a portion I just clipped from a whole page of um, ones in a book. And on the left-hand side, it um, describes information about the groom. It gives the name, his residence, his occupation, his birthplace, the name of his father, his father's birthplace, the name of his mother with the maiden name, yay, um, and her birthplace. And then if we look at the next column, it gives some particulars. It has his color, age, number of marriage. This was his second marriage. Was he a widower or divorced? He was a widower, not divorced. And so make sure you look at that to see if um, this is a person's first or second marriage. On the right hand side you see information about the bride. Similar, you know, same questions. And then you could see that this was on the far right, her first marriage. Also, if you look at the very bottom, it's always advisable to check out who the witnesses are because they're often family members or people that you might recognize in your tree. Here's another example of a marriage. This one's from Buffalo in 1900. And if we read down from the top, you'll see, you know, the, the groom's full name, where he resides, his age, his color, his occupation, whether he was single or widowed, his birthplace was Canada, his father's name, John Parkin, um, the mother's maiden name, Anne, that this was his first marriage. And then here's the information on the bride. It lists her name her residence um, of the bride, her age, her color, whether she was single or widowed. Divorce wasn't given as an option. <laughs> um, her maiden name, if a widow. Um, her place, birthplace of the bride was Canada. Her father's name, her mother's maiden name, and the number of marriage. Um, and this was her first. So because the bride and groom, in theory, were the ones providing this information for the marriage certificate as they're living and they were the ones applying to get marriage, um, married, I'm happy that there's the parents' names on there, you know, that said John, Parkin, and Anne, but why didn't Bert know his mother's maiden name? But, you know, at least I've got the certificate, and I guess three and a half out of the four names is better than nothing. Um, so marriage certificates are a wonderful type of document to help you um, go up a generation if you're not sure of who the parents are. Here's a transcript of a marriage certificate from Horseheads, New York. I was um, trying to use this for my application to join the Mayflower Society. And the Mayflower Society's historian that was helping me with my application asked me to go back um, to the Horseheads clerk and ask for an original of the document. The clerk was really sweet and did take a picture for me, and she said she had to stand on a chair so she could fit it all in one shot because their book, all the entries were on a single line that go across two pages. So that might be a reason why, you know, it's, it's not easy for a clerk to provide information besides just transcribing it out of the record book that they have and providing it on a separate sheet of paper. So if you ask for the original, you might get some pressure back because when she sent it to me, you know, obviously then I got the whole page of all of these people's marriages, not just the family members that I was looking for. Luckily, because this was from 1896, there wasn't any privacy, you know, being so far back in the past. Um, but, you know, that could be a reason why a document isn't provided in the original form if it's included on a in a book that has other people's records and they can't just um, get a picture of that one particular record for you easily. Here's an example from Brooklyn, New York, and these are wonderful three-page marriage records. Um, the first page is the affidavit for license to marry, and you can see the name of the groom and bride at the top, and then the um, statistic, you know, information about the groom on the left, um, you know, the same type of information that we've seen 
before, you know, place of birth, where you're residing, your age, you know, mother's maiden name, all that great stuff. Same for the uh, bride on the right with their signatures. The second page of this um, three-page document is the Certificate of Record of Marriage with similar biographical information. And having it on a second page is great because what if something was illegible on the first page? This gives you another chance to um, take a look at some of that information. And then the third page is a confirmation by the clergyman or magistrate that the marriage ceremony was performed. And this, just as a side note, I had this information and I was curious. I'd love to find the church that they were married in. They were married in 1915. And somebody helped me by looking up the name of the priest that performed the certificate in the um, World War I draft registration cards, and he listed the church that he was working at. So now I have that information that I can go try to track down to see um, if that was the church he was at two years prior, <laughs> and um, then I can um, maybe find some church records of this marriage. In Pennsylvania, this is from 1894. This is an example of their marriage um, books. And it's kind of a three-part form similar to the one from Brooklyn we've just looked at, but it's on kind of one sheet of paper. There's two documents right here, two different brides and grooms. Um, at the top, you'll see an application for the marriage license. That's where it lists the groom and the bride, the same information we've been looking at. And then towards the bottom, you'll see in the capital letters, the marriage license. Um, and then at the very bottom where it says duplicate certificate, this is where the minister, justice of the peace, or alderman signed that he performed the ceremony. So this is an interesting thing too. Just because a couple applies for a marriage license doesn't actually mean that they got married. So you want to keep that in mind. You can actually find ones like this where the top portion of the book has been completed and then the bottom is blank because they applied for the marriage license but then didn't actually go through the wedding. And then, of course, sometimes with marriage, marriage comes divorce, um, and local municipalities kept records of these too. Okay, moving on to death certificates. Here's an example of a certificate from Pennsylvania in 1910. You know, if you read across the top, it gives the name of the person that passed away. And then on the left hand side, the personal and statistical particulars. It gives the sex, color, the date of birth, his age, um, whether he's single, married, w um, widowed, or divorced, his birthplace, his occupation, the name of his father, the birthplace of his father, the maiden name of the mother, and the birthplace of the mother. And it says, the above stated personal particulars are true to the best of my knowledge and belief, and the informant is Mrs. G.G. G. Webster. Now, G.G. G. Webster was Barna's daughter, so she would definitely be a more credible um, person informant than a neighbor or a hospital employee. So you always have to look at the informant to kind of help you weigh the information given in those personal and statistical particulars um, part of the certificate um, to see how credible they are. On the right hand side you'll see the medical certificate of death and so this is be you'll find out how long a person was sick, um, what was their cause of death, if there was any contributing factors to it, and the doctor's um, signature. Then at the very bottom um, right is the place of burial, um, which you know like what cemetery did they uh, get removed to. Here's another example of a death certificate. This is in Buffalo in 1919. And I just wanted to point out, you know, how we talked about in the last certificate, how what the informant was the daughter. Now, she might not have known her grandparents. They might have passed away before. Um, but, you know, her family told her, well, you know, your dad's dad's name was this. In this particular instance, this young lady, she passed away and the informant is her father. So when they're asking what is the name of the father, he's he's naming himself. So that holds very high weight, um, you know, even more so than the one of the daughter in the previous example or a neighbor or hospital worker. 
just to kind of show you around the country a little bit, here is um, a death certificate from Texas in 1910. It's the same basic format that we've been looking at. So we've looked at one from Pennsylvania, one from Buffalo, one from Texas. You know, they kind of all look, look the same. Now I'm going to show you one that looks a little bit different. Um, Chemung County, 1911. This death certificate is a little unusual to me because a lot of areas were left incomplete and the informant isn't known to me. Uh, I don't recognize that name at all. So what's interesting is that how most of the document was handwritten and then information such as where the parents were born were typed onto the document later. So I don't know who who provided that information. Was it the same informant that provided the handwritten information? Why was certain items typed on afterwards? Um, so I'm going to treat this this particular document a little bit more cautiously as far as whether I'm going to take you know the the place the names and places of his parents because I'm not sure who the informant was. And then secondly, was it the same person that was typing on the document as well? For this death certificate, you might notice um, on the right hand side, you know, the cause of death might lead you to wonder about what it had happened. You know, in this particular one, the contributing factor was burns of the arms and chest. When you see things like that, check the newspapers for a story um, that might help explain the cause of death. And then you can check the certificate to see if there was an autopsy formed or performed. This next certificate shows um, where my great-great-grandfather, he was struck by a train and an autopsy was performed. So that can lead you to another document. Now, not all places will release um, coroner's reports. Uh, so you have to ask, but in this case for Erie County, I was able to obtain a copy of that. So just wanted to point out that detail on death certificates as well. So now that we've seen examples of birth, of marriage, and death certificates, you can find some of them on genealogy websites. We will start with Ancestry, and to go to find them, you would search their card catalog. So at the top, you would go to Search Card Catalog, and then you can narrow down all of the collections that they have by just clicking on the category for birth, marriage, and death. You can even narrow it down to where, you know, click on USA. Then you can, you can select the particular state that you're researching in. You're going to find that they have millions and millions of records. This is, these are just some of them that I clipped out, you know, from Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Indiana. Um, and you can see they have, um, you know, different age, or. Um, year ranges that they have there, you know, these don't necessarily always come up as hints um, in your tree. Sometimes you have to go to these collections and search them. Ancestry does not provide hints on every single collection that they have. A couple other states that they have, and they have many more, and I was just picking out. I'm, I'm sure that Ohio has birth and death on there too. I was just clicking and clicking around so you can see ones here from Vermont, Ohio, and Michigan. Millions of records. That's just Ancestry. Family Search has millions of records too. And again, I just was selecting random ones. You can see ones here from Idaho, Maine, and Texas. Lots of different um, records available online for free at Family Search, or if you subscribe to any of the other websites like Ancestry or um, Find My Past or My Heritage. When you're going through, you might see um, indexes. Um, so you need to see here New York, New York, that would be New York City, you know, index to birth certificates, index to death certificates, index to marriage license, or it's just New York State birth index, death mar index, marriage index, things like that. 
So an index is a list, and it's a list to help find the original certificate. So this is a great clue, but you don't want to stop there. You want to go use that information to go find the original because there can be errors on the on an index as it was you know abstract and transcribed from the original so you always want to go find the original so an event was recorded where the event occurred even if your family lived in North Tonawanda but you were born in Lockport your birth certificate would be filed in Lockport not where you resided where the event occurred and so per the law, the local municipality also made a copy and sent it to the New York State Department of Health. So in theory, you should be able to request a copy of the certificate you're interested in from both the local municipality and the New York State Department of Health. So let's start with the Department of Health. They have a website for their vital statistics, and on it um, they have a whole page for genealogy records and resources, and they describe on there that there are restrictions um, of years for privacy reasons when you're requesting a genealogical copy. The current restrictions are for birth certificates, they have to be on file for at least 75 years, and that the person whose name is on the birth certificate is known to be deceased. For death certificates, it has to be on file for at least 50 years. And for marriage certificates, it has to be on file for at least 50 years, and both spouses have to be known to be deceased. Exceptions can be made for direct line descendants, and they say, um, a direct line descendant is a person in the direct line of the descendant, such as the child, grandchild, great-grandchild, the person whose record they're requesting. And you have to provide the following. You need to prove your relationship to the person. Um, you need to prove the death of the person, if it's their birth certificate, and the proof of the death of both spouses whose marriage certificate you are requesting. When you're requesting a copy from the Department of Health, you fill out this form. It's DOH 4384. It was last updated December of 2005. And what's nice um, thing about this is it's a PDF form, and you can just type in the fields and print it out. And here's a suggestion for me. Print out a second copy for your own records, just in case they are to lose it or if you need um, you know, it's, it can take a little while. You need proof that you had done it. Just print print out a second second copy for yourself. The prices that they currently charge um, is for one to three year search is twenty two dollars per copy. And this is even if they find it or don't find it, if there's no record, you still pay the $22. And then for longer searches, you can see they'll charge more if you're not sure of the year. But you know what happened in this decade? Between the four to 10 years, it would be $42 for a copy. Um, if you need them to check 11 to 20 years, $62, and so on. So at the bottom of their page, they have processing a genealogy request may take eight months or longer. If the municipality where the event took place is known, submitting your request directly to the local registrar or a municipal clerk may save considerable time. Well, they're not kidding because eight months is is nowhere near where they're taking now. They are taking closer to two years to fulfill genealogy requests. I'm currently waiting on ones that I submitted back in May of 2019. They didn't cash my check until the end of November, slightly after six months that I written it. Um, I have escalated this with my assembly person, not because I was in particular rushed to get the documents, but that I feel that, you know, if all of us are sending money um, to New York State that the Department of Health could perhaps hire some more staff to handle the load that they have on their tables. Um, maybe instead of us having us mail in the documents that um, they uh, allow us to request them online. I feel like just even them, I'm sure they have a person that just sits there and opens their mail. Uh, you know, and maybe there was, I feel that there was things that we could do to easily make this process a little bit better, including, you know, making the documents available for free through the archives and such like that. So I have escalated it and they have um, approached the Department of Health on my behalf um, and that's ongoing right now. 
So that's ordering from the Department of Health. And if we take their advice where they say if the municipality where the event took place is known, try submitting your request directly to them. So we, unless you want to wait two years for your documents, going you know to try to obtain them from the local municipality is often much faster and sometimes cheaper, um, a cheaper way to go about it. So definitely check out the local municip municipalities. So in Niagara County, um, we have a lot of different local municipalities. And again, you have to remember that the event was recorded where it occurred. This is a sheet I made up. It's available for free at our Niagara County Genealogical Society Library at 215 Niagara Street. So right now our library is closed due to the coronavirus, but when it opens back up, you're welcome to come visit us on Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays from 1 to 5. And um, you can see this handout that I've made there. So when we start looking at the municipalities of Niagara County, you'll see that we start with three cities. We have Lockport, Niagara Falls, and North Tonawanda. So when I go to check out some of their websites, the city of Lockport has this on their website for their office of the city clerk. You can see that they state they have birth, marriage, and death records um, starting with the year 1880, and that they follow the same years of privacy that New York State does, with the um, 75 years for birth, 50 years for marriage, and 50 years for death. On their website, they have an application with directions. You just print it out, fill it out, and it's $11 per record copy. Um, very nice information that they have there. The City of Niagara Falls has a web page showing their rules for ordering a copy, um, you know, saying that um, it would come with a stamp for genealogical research only, not a certified copy. But they don't have a form or directions to order them, so you'll have to contact them for their instructions and pricing. This is part of the City of North Tonawanda's page for their clerk, and um, there's no information for the date, but they do have a link to their genealogical services, and when you click on that, it pulls up a form that looks identical to the New York State Department of Health form, but I noticed at the top, it says the fee is only $11 versus the um, New York State Department of Health $22, and if you scroll down to the bottom, it's because they're using an old form from 1998, so these must have been the prices from then. So shh, don't say anything that they could put up the new form and, and require $22. So, you know, we'll, we'll take the $11 if you need anything from North Tonawanda. There are 12 towns in, North, um, in Niagara County. And you'll see underneath them, there's many places that are, you know, we could refer to like, oh, hey, let's go over to, you know, that park that's in Wright's Corners or, you know, the tops there, or, you know, things like that. But they're not necessarily incorporated governmental places. So you have to look at the town that those places are located in. Um, so if you wanted, you know, an event happened in Pekin, you're going to have to check with the town of Cambria or the town of Lewiston, depending on where in Pekin it happened, um, to find out who has the record. Not all of the towns had um, genealogical request information on their website, so I'll just show you a few examples. Here's the town of Heartland. Um, and it has the address and the name of the clerk. And then they have on their site that they do provide genealogical searches, that they abide by the New York State restrictions of years, and that their records date back to 1882. The town of Lockport also has information on their website. They include um, an information page that they charge $22 um, for a copy. And then they also show the years that they have, that their births in the town of Lockport begin in 1882, the marriages begin in 1883, and the deaths begin in 1884, and that they also follow the New York State restrictions of years. And then they have a nice application for the town of Lockport that you would just print and fill out and mail to them. 
Notice at the very bottom it says, please send a photocopy of your driver's license along with the completed application. I've had two other municipalities in New York State send back my request because I didn't include my license with them, and I would have had I known that I didn't see that on their application. So my advice, to, you know, just to be safe is just to be sure to include your license um, if you're requesting any, you know, that way it'll help expedite the process. The town of Newfane has some information on their website. They say that they have births from 1875 and a few from 1863, and that their deaths and marriages begin in 1883. And lastly, the town of Somerset had some information on their site. They had a really nice um, PDF that's fillable, and they charge $11 a copy, um, and so that looks fairly um, easy to complete. You print it out, and you send it in. Moving on, um, there are five villages in Niagara County, and I checked all of the, the villages' websites, and none of them mentioned genealogical requests specifically. They do mention that they have files of vital records that include, you know, with, that occurred within the village limits to contact them. So, um, you know, you just have to reach out to each of those places. Also mentioned on my little handout is um, census designated places. These are a concentration of population defined by the Census Bureau for statistical purposes only. They're not incorporated. So if you're looking at an event that occurred in one of those places like Sanborn, um, then you would have to check the town that manages that area because they don't have a government for that area. And as far as county health certificates, it's my understanding that only a few counties in New York are the vital record keepers um, for that area, and those are Shemung, Monroe, Onondaga, and Tompkins. So in closing, when you're looking for a vital record, try to determine where the event occurred. Then secondly, research the locality and see when they started keeping um, records of their vital events. And then third, check to see if those records have been digitized. Fourth, if they haven't been, um, research the request process from the local municipality. Go to their website and see if they have a form like we saw in some of the other ones to complete. And if they do not have a copy or you can't locate it um, you know, from them, then try ordering a copy from the Department of Health and don't hold your breath because it'll take quite a while for it to get there, <laughs> to get back to you. So that finishes up our beginner series on vital records. Um, I hope you're, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you're staying home and safe um, during this difficult time and um, can't wait until we are all together again. Thank you so much.